Marine plants and animals live in a delicate balance with their environment. Ultimately, all life depends on a supply of nutrients. So it might seem that increasing the supply ought to make the marine environment healthier and more productive. In fact, the reverse may be true. If the sea is made too rich in nutrients, the balance in the environment may be upset. If this happens, animals and plants will be affected. Operations like fishing and fish farming may suffer, and there may even be a risk to human health. So we need to understand what sort of effect our activities have on our coastal waters. That's the impulse behind a special research program being carried out by scientists from the Marine Laboratory in Aberdeen. It's called the Loch Linney Project. In the open oceans, there's not much danger that the waters will become too rich in nutrients. But there may be risks in sea locks, bays and estuaries, because there the exchange of water with the open sea is restricted. And inshore, there are greater nutrient inputs from sources like agricultural drainage or sewage disposal. These risks are obviously lower in the northwest of Scotland, which is sparsely populated and where land isn't farmed so heavily. But the new industry of fish farming is also an activity which can artificially increase nutrient concentrations. Excretory products and degradation of surplus feed and waste from the fish all contribute to releases of dissolved nutrients. So it's important to find out how many caged fish a sea lock can support without causing a degree of enrichment that could risk the ecological balance. The marine laboratory in Aberdeen together with the University of Strathclyde and the Plymouth Marine Laboratory, have mounted a major research project to study the problem. The aim is to produce a computer model of a sea loch's environment. The effect of a new fish farm or land drainage scheme on the productivity of coastal waters is going to vary from site to site, and it's not at all easy to calculate what the effect is going to be in any particular instance. The approach we have to use is computer modelling. Computer modelling's got four distinct stages to it. First of all, we have to have a really good idea of how the processes, the physics, the chemistry and the biology of the seawater interact to control the functioning of the ecosystem. Secondly, we have to translate those ideas into mathematical formulae. Then those formulae have to be turned into computer code so that we end up with a computer program that numerically simulates the functioning of the ecosystem. And finally, we have to test the model. Only when we've tested the model can we be sure that our ideas were correct in the first place and that the model we've produced is going to be useful. The testing procedure requires a great deal of data. We need data to provide the parameters and constants in the model, and we also need data to compare with the results produced by the model. That's the essence of the testing procedure. First, let's look at the very complicated processes controlling nutrients in seawater. The main elements are nitrogen, phosphorus and silicon, which are found as inorganic salts in solution. These are taken up by the various living organisms and used in different ways. Near the sea surface, microscopic plants, the phytoplankton, grow and multiply by combining the nutrients with carbon driven by energy from the sunlight. In summer, when the light intensity is high, the phytoplankton in the surface layers grow very rapidly and use up all the available nutrients. To keep on growing, they need new nutrients, and these come from two main sources. Living animals in the loch prey on other animals, eating and digesting them and excreting ammonium salts into the water. At the same time, dead material, corpses, organic waste and detritus are broken down by bacteria and this process releases more mineral salts back into the water. It's difficult enough to study such complex processes in a body of water that's completely enclosed. In a sea loch, 
tidal currents cause a continual exchange of water with the open sea. Nutrients and all the different living organisms are carried by the currents, making the task of modeling much harder. Many Scottish sea lochs are like fjords. They have a shallow sill at the mouth, which separates the deep loch basin from the open sea. Tidal currents over the sill create complicated circulation patterns and layers in the water. The density of water varies according to its temperature and salinity. Fresh water running into the loch from the local river at its landward end is less dense than seawater and forms a layer on the surface. Seawater entering the loch on the flood tide is forced underneath this layer and flows up the loch as an intermediate layer. There's some mixing of the two layers and so the ebb tide takes both fresh and seawater out of the loch before the next flood tide starts the whole cycle off again. In the deepest parts of some sea lochs, cold, dense water may become trapped and form a stagnant bottom layer, which is often rich in nutrients. Storms, or a significant increase in the density of the open sea water, can flush this layer out of the basin. When that happens, even more nutrients will be released into the surface layers. All these biological and physical processes have to be combined in the computer model to track the various changes in nutrient concentrations. The model also looks at the effects of adding more nutrients from other sources, including fish farms. The more detailed and accurate the data available, the better the model is likely to be. And it's this need for detailed data that gives this project its special character and poses some unique problems. Let's look at an example. One of the model's predictions is that in spring, when phytoplankton are particularly active and growing, nutrients will be absorbed in the loch. That will mean that over each tidal cycle, the phytoplankton's need for nutrients will result in an overall movement of nitrogen from the open sea into the loch. In the summer and autumn, however, the phytoplankton are dying or being eaten. Then the loch will become richer in nutrients. The problem is how to test predictions which involve so many different features. To begin with, we need to measure the different nutrient concentrations during each tidal cycle. In other words, samples of water have to be taken from lots of different locations at very frequent intervals. But over the course of the year, we also need to measure the much slower changes in the chemical, physical and biological characteristics of the loch and the open waters outside it. Scientists at the Marine Laboratory in Aberdeen devised a full year's program of investigations. This meant making continuous measurements over a long period of time. Having boats and personnel permanently on site was an expensive option. And so instead, they designed measuring instruments which would work automatically. To measure dissolved nutrient concentrations, for example, chemical reagents have to be added to a sample of water. The reaction produces a colored solution and the intensity of the color indicates the nutrient concentration. These instruments have been designed to do exactly that. They're microprocessor controlled to take samples, add the reagents, measure the resultant color and store all the data in a memory chip. Each one has enough reagents and battery power to operate for a month and is built into an independent rig which is moored in the loch. There, the instrument takes water samples every hour for a month. When it's lifted on board the survey ship, 